It can be difficult not to wonder about the existence of angels and demons. Many people prefer to point at the lack of evidence for such supernatural phenomena. But even if there was, why would the existence of such guardians matter when we have our daily lives to attend to? What's so terrifying about demonic possession when we are staring down the far more harrowing reality of unpaid bills? Growing up Catholic, I was convinced I was surrounded by such beings. It was only after I veered towards agnosticism that I stopped thinking about it so much. At first, I looked into occult practices, Wicca, and New Age cultures. There were a host of religions, practices, and other philosophies to explore, but no matter how far I spread my reach, nothing seemed to stick with me. I was lost in a cemetery of an infinite expanse, with countless headstones, with enough rows to become lost forever. How could I possibly explore all the spiritual ideas of humanity's vast history? Surely one had the right answers. Surely, within this flesh hides a kind of soul, a ghost at least. Though the angels, demons, and wrathful gods and damned sinners have faded from my mind, I see them in the world. Whether they are real or not is besides the point, because the archetypes of these mythologies echo in all of us. By now, most of us have realized that the demons, wherever they are, perhaps aren't in a place called hell. Today, I invite you to meet one who surely dwelled on the surface amongst us in the late 1800s, a man who went by the name H. H. Holmes. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the second installment of the White City Ripper. My name is Harlequin Grimm, and these are the stories of monsters whose voices are lost in history. And this is Mania. If you are just tuning in and are feeling lost, this is a continuation of a previous episode called Beyond the Pale. Here and there, Mania hosts a series which elects to focus on a single subject or individual to explore for multiple episodes. Currently, our spotlight is focused on the notorious H. H. Holmes. The scenes you are about to hear are derived from his autobiography, written while he was in prison awaiting the noose. Now that you've been forewarned, let's be on with the show. One of Holmes's most notable achievements in his killing career is known as the Murder Castle a harrowing structure built with rooms whose purpose was the swift execution and removal of human remains. It's reported to have chambers with gas lines rigged to poison tenants inside, twisting hallways that lead to nowhere, and trap doors leading to basements filled with quickline and dissolving agents. The only thing he was missing was a kind of crematory, but, oh, wait, it says right here in my notes that he had one of those too. A pile of human ashes mixed with bones that didn't fully disintegrate as well? Who knew? But the ingenuity and financial cunning required to have this building constructed would not have been possible were it not for his formative years as a con artist. Working in conjunction with his education at medical schools, Holmes developed a comfortability around the dead. Almost naturally, his business-oriented mind paired this with the manipulation of life insurance policies a practice he grew quite adept at during his years in college. Though Holmes fails to provide the specific month in his autobiography, a process of elimination allows us to deduce that the following events take place around the spring of 1888. Seeing as how he died in 1896, we are approaching the final decade of his life with the most excitement and chaos. In the previous installment, we found ourselves left in Holmes' presence beside a cadaver. And so we return. Corpses always did give him a sense of control. For others, the stony expressions of the dead strike feelings of fear and anxiety. But for medical professionals or those who work in the mortuary business, sharing a room with them becomes commonplace. They feel less like people, and more so like objects. The sight of human bodies easily becomes normal. The work around it even boring. There's nothing sociopathic about it, it's the nature of the business. But to Holmes, this subjectification of corpses was taken one step further. He saw them as cargo, products, opportunities. The previous summer, a good friend of Holmes had died, 
a friend who carried similarly strange entrepreneurial plans regarding the deceased, their death certificates, and the forgery of insurance claims. Holmes had insured his life for $20,000 in favor of his wife, what amounts to $570,000 in our time. After carefully considering the prospective profits, the estimated $4,000 needed to ensure the operation's success, and the serious accidents which might arise to expose him, Holmes committed himself to the plan. One spring morning in 1888, Holmes made his way to the Rush Medical College in Chicago. The city was still recovering from the great fire which occurred a decade before. Construction rigs continued to hammer away, emitting the sounds of clamoring workers and steel tools. The cranes were creaking behemoths, fueled by the substantial donations which had poured in to revive the city after the calamity that had nearly consumed it outright. This is how we find ourselves in Holmes's mind. Surrounded by the ashes of the past, we are born into innovation, a ceaseless desire to build and push further. But amidst the public, Holmes was only a shadow amongst shadows. His disinterested expression beneath his bowler hat was a mirror to the dozens of bustling men and women around him. As always, monsters with a knack for intellect will never find a shortage of hiding places in the maze of modern Western societies. Once inside the medical college, Holmes made a brief show of small talk with new faces, old acquaintances, and colleagues. The performance was short-lived, as his confidence and stern manner saw him through to his destination with a fair swiftness, the morgue, though Holmes prefers to call it the dead room, which I find all too charming. Within the dead room, Holmes made a quick friend of the mortician assigned to that all too enviable job of looking after the deceased. Looking into his eyes, he contemplated the risks of lying to him. What Holmes was looking for was a body, but not just any body. It had to look just like him. Realizing that this task could take some time, Holmes decided to concoct a story concerning his interest in securing a particular corpse. Another loose end was the janitor who cleaned the place nightly. He could grow suspicious of Holmes' own activities during graveyard hours. After earning his trust by digging into his pockets, all Holmes had left to do was wait. Thus became the bizarre morning routine of H.H. H. Holmes. Every day he would find himself patrolling the arrivals and the hospital's dead room, which never ceased to have fresh additions. In this, he had what he described as a, quote, most gloomy wait, lasting about two weeks, end quote. It would be difficult to find a body to be a substitute for his own. Holmes had what is known as a cow lick. Initially, I thought this was some deformity around the mouth, but no, what he was worried about is a section of the hair, typically around the crown, which stands at an angle against the normal growth pattern of the rest of the hair. But even this specific detail proved to be only needing an adequate amount of patience. Humans, as it turns out, are fantastic at turning out the dead. On May 20th, Holmes was informed that a man had been killed after falling from a freight car. The body arrived at the dead room in due time, and after a close examination, Holmes decided he was precisely the doppelganger cadaver he required. Without missing a beat, Holmes moved on to the next steps of his plan, despite both the rising number and severity of risks. On this topic, Holmes himself wrote, All the precautions that the mind can conceive and the body execute had to be brought into execution. No chance for detection now could be entertained, no loophole for surprise and discomfiture was to be left uncovered, and I had to do all that was vitally necessary to this end alone. Holmes then went to the home of a friend whose profession, incidentally, was moving cargo. Only and quite hilariously did Holmes find his trusted professional to be just as dead as the cargo he needed shipping. Though Holmes was in dire need of individuals with similar habits of turning a blind eye to unsavory affairs, the late 1800s were still a time of taboo in the medical industry, specifically regarding the care and handling of dead. Though the turn of the century was rapping on the door, the exhumation, examination, and dissection of human remains was still highly controversial, and so, just like with any product demand for which the law cannot defend, a pocket to professional crime was there to fill the gaps. 
After exchanging the right rumors with exactly the wrong individuals, Holmes had the name of a man willing to complete his task, what he referred to as outside work. How much will you charge me for taking a body from the college to Polk Street Station? he asked. Five dollars was the man's reply, about one hundred thirty in our time. What remained, of course, was the method. Holmes's destination for the corpse was not a mere stone's throw from Chicago. That meant his cargo would have to be kept in plain sight, even survive a train ride. This begged the question, how? He couldn't exactly bring on a casket without being asked questions. Dismembering the remains wouldn't do either, as his body was going to act as the proof of Holmes's tragic and accidental death. Seeing as how extraordinary corpses require extraordinary evidence, Holmes wasn't prepared to set up a crime scene which suggested somebody had just butchered him. For this, Holmes outsourced yet another job. He ordered for the custom design and creation of a suitcase of, quote, more than ordinary large size, resembling an iron-bound burglar-proof arrangement which jewelry salesmen call sample cases, end quote. But the outside was not nearly as important as the inside, wherein the greater portion of it was occupied by a large zinc box of sufficient dimensions to allow a man to occupy it by doubling his joints, again, quote, where doubling is necessary. Lastly, a lid of wood was affixed to it to deafen any sound that might have been caused by rattling. Rattling, you ask? Why, yes, of course, because the entire trunk is waterproof. Waterproof, you ask? Why, yes, of course, because the trunk was designed to hold an amount of ice in it so as to slow the rate of decomposition. All this next to somebody and their poor Aunt Susie's carry-on luggage on a train exiting the city. Of course, the transportation of such luggage would not be so simple. Holmes's first mistake was hiring a man outside of mortuary and medical work to assist him in packing the body into the trunk. After taking careful instructions to assist him, Holmes noticed that the man he'd hired was growing pale and, well, wasn't doing so well with the doubling of joints where necessary bit. Holmes knew that discomfort well enough. Seeing a corpse for the first time, let alone touching and manipulating it so as to shove it into a trunk, is not always easy on the stomach. Finally, after they'd finished packing away the cargo, the postman stood up, mopped the sweat away from his forehead, and took a shaky breath. Holmes caught the telltale demeanor of a man about to make a bold claim he wasn't quite prepared to make. I can't do this job for five dollars, the postman said. It was in the dead of night. The chill of the dead room had settled on their skin. It crept in through the layers of their clothes. The smell of sickly human rotting pervaded the air. Not strong enough to turn the stomach, rather just enough to sit at the edges of one's senses at all times. Holmes wore a wan grin. This was his environment. He had no reason to fear. Because, the postman continued, if I make a hearse of my wagon and personally act as the driver, Undertaker and Paul Bearer, I must have thirty-five. If I don't get that sum, I shall inform the police that it is all not right. Of course, of course, Holmes cooed. The condescension so thick in his soul it nearly spilled outright. He gave the postman the five dollars up front and agreed to pay the other thirty once they'd reached the station. One awkward, bumpy ride with heavy cargo in the back, and they'd arrived at Illinois' central station. Once the trunk had been placed on the platform in preparation for boarding, The driver turned to Holmes and demanded the rest of the payment. This was the moment Holmes had been waiting for. The grin he wore in the morgue turned into a vicious, amused laughter. I shall not give you another cent. Besides, I have a mind to demand the return of the five dollars from you for attempting to extort money from me. Once more, the driver repeated his threat of calling the authorities. Holmes leaned towards the driver. The mirthful grin devoid of empathy was an expression that several had already seen in their final moments, and there were many more to come. It had its own way of charming the living. You may go, Holmes said, but first listen to me and answer my questions. Did you not, in the presence of myself and the janitor, help place the corpse in the trunk? Did you not haul it here? Have you not assisted me in all this work? Yes, I have, the postman replied. That man was murdered. Speak a word about it to anyone, and I will have you arrested as an accessory to this murder. The body must go into the lake, but there's always room for one more as well. I hope you are beginning to understand me. Hearing this, 
The driver returned the $5 to Holmes, promised that he had no intention of requesting any further payment, and that he would be at his service at any future request. After watching the driver fade into the streets, Holmes smiled at one of the train attendants, presented his ticket for the Timberlands of Michigan, and had his trunk checked for its adventurous trip north. Maneuvering the trunk onto the train, the attendant remarked to Holmes, Heavens, what have you got in here? Oh, I can never pack light. Old habits die hard, he said. Rather satisfied with himself for having diverted the alarm of the postman, Holmes settled in for a long train ride. As the scenery rolled by and Chicago shrank behind him, his thoughts wandered, but one concern never quite left the foreground of his mind. Just when would the trunk start to smell? Thank you for listening to the second installment of the White City Ripper. When Mania's Theater reopens for the next episode, we'll find ourselves right back with Holmes on the train when that cargo of his gets him into some tremendous trouble. I am both pleased and unsettled to say that the contents of this story are entirely true, so long as the word of Holmes is taken as gospel. The details, characters, and events, after all, are all taken out of his autobiography. I have elected to trust him with a majority of his own stories, as I find it difficult to find articles and sources out there even mentioning some of these escapades. Typically, I have to fabricate the dialogue between characters which moves the story forward, but for this story, I have the luxury, again, for relying on Holmes. The only instances where truth is stretched, really, is in imagining the environments and mindset we find Holmes in. Holmes omits certain locations, such as the medical college, and prefers to remain vague, perhaps to protect the reputation of those there who allowed him to get away with his crimes. Doing a bit of research on which colleges were available at this time, I took an educated guess. Other than that, we are once again stuck with the tried and true adage that truth is far stranger than fiction. And with that, let's move on to some crypt cleaning. Firstly, I would love to thank everyone who is supporting the show. Whether you are recommending it to your friends, family, rating it on iTunes or wherever you listen to it, or are supporting it directly with donations, you really are helping to keep this show running. Being the sole writer and producer of Mania can be very difficult at times, but the community that is showing up around it truly makes it worthwhile. And now, I think it's only fair to update you on some variables in my life which led to this month's later upload. But before we get to that, I would like to say that I do plan, before the end of January, to upload a third installment right next to this one, in keeping with my goal of two episodes a month. But the reason for this episode's delay is that I recently switched day jobs, or rather, I'm now working a night job. I've left behind the day job which I had for three years, and am instead pursuing a career in mortuary arts. So yes, your narrator is now in fact an undertaker. I did this because I felt, as a storyteller, a certain hypocrisy or flimsiness in writing about the macabre without ever truly having lived it. Many people boast their love for gothic romantic stories and horror, but how do they actually fare around corpses, blood, gore, and tragedy? I wanted to find out how I fare, and also to give some substance, some credibility, maybe even authority, to the necessary details which comprise so much of this podcast content. Plenty of artists create dark art, how many of them also live it. It's always been my mission with Mania to give something unique, a fresh perspective on the darker shades of life. Even though I stand by my intuitions and philosophies in light of my recent experiences at a mortuary, I now feel more confident in the stories I am bringing you, because now it's not just speculation. The way that Holmes reflected on the postman touching a dead body for the first time, that was in part inspired by my first experience touching a corpse, my anxiety, and the sense of normality Holmes felt around the whole affair. That was my sense of normality after 12 hours of being around death too. I look forward to how this job will inspire my writing in a way that work never has before, and I hope you notice the difference too. That being said, it is still my goal to produce as much as possible. Simply put, the time and energy to write and produce these episodes can't be done alone. And that's why this show is in part sponsored by Audible. Audible has one of the largest collections of audiobooks available, and if you use Mania's links to sign up for a trial, you'll receive a complimentary audiobook entirely of your choice. 
In doing so, you'll also be supporting the show. Win win. So go to audibletrial.com forward slash mania. Once more, that's audibletrial.com forward slash mania to summon up a free audiobook of your choosing. And with that, I bid you a dark farewell. I do sincerely hope you'll join me next time.